<sighs> once again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on today's online event, Challenges and Opportunities in Caring for Medicare and Medicaid Dual Eligible. This event is sponsored by the Center for Healthcare Strategies and the Government Innovators Network. And I'd like to begin, as we do, with a quick poll to give everybody a better idea of the composition of our audience. All you need to do is click directly on your screen to the option that best applies to you. And I'll just leave that up there for a few more to let everybody respond. All right, well, thank you very much. As you see, we have a very diverse audience with us today. There are the results of the poll. And with those results up, uh, I'd like to hand over the control of the floor to uh, Stephen Goldsmith, who will offer us some brief opening remarks uh, introduce our moderator for today. Steve is formerly the mayor of Indianapolis, and he is currently the Dan Paul Professor of Government here at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Steve? Uh, thanks, Jim, and thanks for your good work. And uh, I, uh, again, I, I apologize for the as you have about the uh, the phone situation, hope they get it can get resolved. Um, uh, let me uh, let me thank all of you for joining. The uh, uh, Kennedy School does these uh, online conversations on important uh, public policy issues uh, on a regular uh, basis. They are archived in our uh, site, and uh, at the end, Jim will show you how to get to those. For uh, those of you who want to um, uh, see the powerpoints or learn more about um, what what other discussions. We've had a great opportunity to bring together policymakers interested in kind of uh, thinking about innovative approaches to important public policy issues. And I want to today um, uh, thank uh, Melanie Bella in particular, uh, who is a senior vice president at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. And I've known Melanie for many years, uh, including the Medicaid director in the state of Indiana, where she paid a lot of time looking about uh, looking at the problems of a approximately 900,000 low-income and disabled students and, and won a number of awards as, as a result of it. We, we are uh, uh, pleased that uh, uh, Center for Healthcare Strategies could join us and these other experts who are with us today and thinking about this uh, obviously important issue of dual eligible. I have to say that the uh, number of people who wanted to participate in this discussion exceeded our capacity, which was not an issue we exactly assumed would happen when somebody said dual eligible. So. Affect, events goes in. affecting a, a, a large number of, of people and a large number of, of state budgets. And with that, I turn the uh, turn the floor over to Melanie Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome, everyone, to the call. Uh, my remarks will be brief so that we can get into the substance and really hear from those people that are doing this in the field. Um, just to, by way of background, the Center for Healthcare Strategies is a nonprofit organization that works on uh, improving quality and cost effectiveness of publicly financed care for people with chronic illnesses and disabilities, the elderly and racially and ethnically diverse populations. We do quite a bit of work with state purchasers and health plans, as well as other groups, again, to try to demonstrate the, the power for improving the quality of the Medicaid program. The uh, Center for Healthcare Strategies is fortunate to be working on a program that is focused on integrating care for the dual eligibles. We are working directly with five states in that program, Florida, Minnesota, New Mexico, New York, and Washington, to integrate financing, delivery, and administration of what we call the gold standard, which covers primary care, acute care, long-term care services and supports, as well as social and behavioral supports that are so critical to this population. We also have the good fortune to be working with uh, several other pioneering states, including Massachusetts, Wisconsin, and Arizona. And so rather than um, hear from me, I'm going to turn it over so we can get started with the experts. I'm going to first introduce Chuck Milligan, who is the Executive Director of the Center for Health Program Development and Management at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Chuck is going to provide a brief introduction uh, to 
to the dual eligibles, um, many people when you say dual eligibles have no idea what it is we're talking about and I'm confident by the time Chuck is through we will all have a very, very good picture of this population uh, whose care we are seeking to improve. So with that, thank you Chuck and um, please get us started. Well, thank you very much. Uh, just really briefly, um, when my son was little, like four years old, his best friend's dad was a firefighter and my son was very envious and my son tried to brag about me and said that at least his dad can sit in a chair all day and not fall out. And uh, it's nice to be able to do one of these things and sitting in my chair and not trying to fall out. I'm going to just go through the who are the dual eligibles very briefly just to set up the context. And um, let me just begin with some very basic things. Um, and this is, uh, the first slide is not surprising. Dual eligibles are typically lower incomes and more health care conditions than other Medicare beneficiaries. The dark bar in, in this slide represents the dual, that is people on Medicare who also have Medicaid benefits. You can see on the top that duals are, 73% uh, of duals are below $10,000 a year, and this is 2002 data. Duals have uh, a much higher rate of uh, poor health status, much higher rate of diabetes, much higher uh, rate of, of stroke and Alzheimer's and much more likely to reside in a long-term care facility. Uh, duals are also um, have a lot more functional impairments than other Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, the two uh, sets of bars on the left-hand side represent the dual eligibles who are under age 65. And um, let me just sort of explain what this depicts. Um, from left to right, it's um, uh, sort of different uh, levels of impairment and different levels of functional uh, need. Duals, 9% of duals have, require assistance with three or more activities of daily living as compared to 6% of other Medicare beneficiaries, that second set of bars. 15% of duals require assistance with walking as compared to 12% of um, other Medicare beneficiaries. And 41% of duals have difficulty with one or more ADLs as compared to 32% of other Medicare beneficiaries, and again, this is the under 65 population. When you look at the 65 plus population, the two sets of bars on the right-hand side, it's even a greater um, difference between the duals and other Medicare beneficiaries, and you can see, roughly speaking, it's about a four to one ratio of uh, different kinds of needs. So. Um, Medicare Advantage plans and others who are familiar with Medicare um, are, are learning and will be learning and quickly learning about the, the fact that dual eligibles are uh, much more pronounced in their needs for activity, with activities of daily living. Uh, on average, dual eligibles cost twice as much uh, as other Medicare beneficiaries, uh, and this is true um, in, in a lot of different ways, but if you just look in, in total, and this is um, the health care expenditures duals compared to other Medicare beneficiaries, roughly twice in total, uh, 18,000 versus 8,400, um, and this is a, a roughly two, year 2000 data. The under 65 cohort um, it, it is similar numbers and the 65 and older cohort is, is, is similar numbers as well. So duals cost more than Medi other Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, duals represent 14% um, of Medicaid's enrollment but account for 40% of Medicaid spending. Um, these data reflect um, a period of time before Part D moved some of the drug benefit, moved the drug benefit to Medicare. Uh, but it's, it's a good representation of uh, the cost for serving the duals. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the duals represent uh, about 17% of all Medicare enrollees. So the total Medicare enrollment in that far left-hand bar is about 42 million, and duals represent 17% of that group, yet account counted in this year for 29% of all Medicare expenditures. On the right-hand side, you can see that picture as depicted in Medicaid expenditures, uh, roughly total Medicaid enrollment of 55 million, of which 14% were duals, yet duals accounted for 40% of Medicaid's expenditures in that period of time. Um, sorry. Okay, I'll call you back. Um, yep. 
in the wrong direction. Okay, now there's a couple of important points to sort of pull out of this. Most of Medicaid spending on duals is on long-term care. Um, this is, as I said the slide before, duals accounted for 40% of all Medicaid expenditures. Of that amount for the duals, two-thirds were for long-term care, 15% were for acute care. Much of that was picking up cost sharing under Medicare, but there were some additional benefits, and there's a slide uh, coming up to pull this out. 14% was for uh, prescription drugs, and then 5% was for Medicare premiums. So one of the, the main takeaways from this slide is even though Part D has moved the drug benefit to Medicare, um, Medicaid will still continue to pay for a tremendous amount uh, of dollars for duals in the area of long-term care and acute care. Um, and this is really because of the difference in the benefit design between the two programs. Medicaid is paying for a lot of long-term care because of the absence of a meaningful Medicare nursing facility benefit. These are categories of service. The dark bars represent Medicaid spending for duals in that category of service, and the, the white or clear bar represents Medicare spending for that category of service. So if you look from left to right, for inpatient services, Medicaid did not pay for a lot of care for duals. Medicare carried the lion's share of that. Um, and similarly, sort of moving left to right, for physician and outpatient, yeah. be because there is a good Medicare benefit, Medicare paid for a lot of that. Medicaid paid for prescription drugs in this period of time. Um, and Medicare paid for more um, skilled nursing care and home health. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here. Here. I've got it. Now. Okay. I, I'm just going to. Please make sure that your phone is muted. That to mute that we're hearing of audience members. If you could please make sure that your phone is muted by pushing 6, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Bye bye, Chuck. Sure. So just uh, staying on this slide, and I'm on the next to last one, moving left to right. For nursing facility, this is not skilled nursing facility, which was represented in the slide so far as to the immediate left. But for, uh, for nursing facility care, Medicaid paid the lion's share because there isn't a meaningful Medicare benefit for non-skilled nursing facility care. And so really, Medicaid's expenditures in long-term care reflect a lot of the, uh, the nature of the benefit design in Medicare. Uh, this, this particular picture uh, is, a, is a blowout of the one two slides ago. And you can see that of all of the Medicaid expenditures for duals, two-thirds were on long-term care. And I'm going to go sort of from the top of the pie and around to the right. Uh, 5.6 billion, or 5.3%, was for Medicare premiums. 11 billion was for Medicare covered services, but where Medicaid had some cost sharing obligations for uh, deductibles and coinsurance and that sort of thing. 15 billion or 14 percent, 14.4 percent represented prescription drugs. Other acute of 4 billion reflects Medicaid spending on acute care benefits that are not part of the Medicare benefit package where Medicaid is, is primary. Um, one of the important things to keep in mind always in, in talking about the duals and especially in terms of coordinated care approaches for the duals is the duals are not um, uniformly seniors. And this is something that is uh, misunderstood commonly. Uh, two thirds of the duals uh, roughly are age 65 and older, but a third of the duals, or 2.5 million, um, are people below age 65 with disabilities. And so it's important in designing coordinated care approaches that there be uh, a recognition that the younger people with disabilities have other kinds of needs, other kinds of desires about housing and jobs and transportation that um, are important to consider in coordinated care approaches. Uh, there are uh, duals who are not full benefit duals. There are Medicaid does pay for premiums and cost sharing for people who are not entitled to um, Medicaid benefits. You know, there's a lot of uh, alphabet soup about this from Quimby's and Slimby's and qualified working disab disabled individuals and QI programs, and some of the rules are set forth here. The main uh, point to keep in mind is that whenever we're talking about duals, we need to understand, are we talking about people who are entitled to the full Medicaid benefit package, or are we also including people who, 
for whom Medicaid picks up some of their Medicare-related cost sharing, but Medicaid is not adding additional benefits. So the main, um, and I will conclude there, the main takeaways I'd like to just set up the discussion for now, um, duals um, are poor, have more disabilities, have more functional impairments across all ages. They are expensive in both programs. There is a mismatch in terms of benefit design in the two programs that requires some good coordination of care because of which program is lead and which program is secondary or not at all. And that uh, the duals um, comprise all ages uh, and, and not just seniors. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. Um, just to uh, reiterate Chuck's point, I think he's done a great job of showing us that the duals are complex. So with their healthcare needs, they're costly. Just to reiterate, from the Medicaid perspective, 7 million out of 55 million total beneficiaries are driving over 40% of the cost. And that this is, not a, this is not a homogeneous population. This is a population with special needs and different needs. And I want to emphasize Chuck's point that the, keeping in mind that a third of the duals are, are individuals with disabilities and two-thirds are seniors is really important as we talk a little bit further in the call about different types of care models you might want to design for duly eligible populations. So, so thank you very much. Let's hope you didn't fall out of your chair, but you did a great job setting the stage. And now we, um, we're going to hold questions for Chuck, and we'll take questions for Chuck and Terry and Jim all at the end of, of um, the first segment of the call. And next I would like to introduce Terry Pratt and Jim Berdier, who Terry and Jim are going to talk a little bit about the intersection of Medicare and Medicaid, both in terms of care delivery and in terms of financing. Terry is the Deputy Director for the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group at CMS, the Center for Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services. Terry has been a tremendous advocate um, for those of us that live and breathe Medicaid, and so we are thankful that she's in her position. And Jim Verdier is a senior fellow at Mathematical Policy Research, and Jim does a tremendous amount of work both with states and uh, with special needs plans, and it's, uh, Mathematica is evaluating the special needs plans as part of the evaluation required by Congress. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Terry, who's going to start, and then Jim will follow, and then we'll open it up to questions for Chuck, Terry, and Jim. So Terry, thank you very much. No, I, think, um, I want to thank you for the gracious um, opening, and I also want to let everybody on the line know that I'm joined here by Danielle Moon, who's the Deputy Director of the Medicare Enrollment and Appeals Group, in anticipation that your questions may be broader than just Medicaid. Um, Chuck shared with us uh, a lot of information about the demographics of the dual eligible population, and what I would like to talk to you a little bit about is the various federal health care programs that are available to support the needs of these individuals. And as you saw by Chuck's information, um, they can be very costly and uh, very service intensive. Um, to do that, if we can go to the slide that talks about the history and the, the description of the program, I'd like to take a step back in time, back to 1965. And it was at that point in time that both of these provisions of federal statute were passed. Um, Medicare is found in Title 18 of the Social Security Act, and Medicaid is found in Title 19 of the Social Security Act. Uh, these are two distinct programs, and we'll talk in a minute about those distinctive differences. And I'm not sure at the point in time that this legislation was passed that anyone anticipated the uh, degree to which these two programs would intersect in the provision of providing health care. And although these provisions um, of the law were initially enacted in 1965. Uh, on a rather regular and routine basis, Congress tries to acknowledge the ever-changing needs of health care, and we often see uh, some major legislative changes to help keep us current. If we can go to the next slide, we'll spend, spend a few minutes here talking about the differences between Medicare versus Medicaid. Um, from a geographic perspective, Medicare is a national program that is uh, consistent across the country. I believe there are some nuances geographically, but if you are and receive Medicare, uh, pretty much anywhere you go in the country, your benefit package is going to look the same. 
Uh, Medicaid, on the other hand, is a statewide program, and each state has the opportunity to customize their program to meet the needs of the individuals that they serve and uh, the provider organizations that are able to have the capacity to provide services. With regard to the authority uh, for administering these programs, for Medicare, it is managed at the federal level on a national basis. Uh, Medicaid is a hybrid. Medicaid is administered by the state through a state plan amendment process whereby they enter into a contract with the federal government for the provision of providing services within their state. And they're required to meet minimum federal requirements in order to provide their program. Eligibility. Eligibility for Medicare really is a health insurance program that's for people who are age 65 or older. Um, people under age 65 with certain disabilities, and people of all ages with end-stage renal disease. Medicaid, uh, on the other hand, is, the eligibility is actually based on income and resources, and it's only available to certain low-income individuals and families who fit into an eligibility group that's recognized by the federal government. And last but not least are the benefit packages. Uh, Medicare is often seen as the primary payer of inpatient hospital services to the elderly and ESRD. Uh, typically what you see as the major benefit packages offered by Medicare is something called Part A hospital insurance, which helps cover inpatient care in hospitals, including critical access hospitals and skilled nursing facilities. Another benefit you'll hear reference when talking about Medicare is Part B medical insurance, and this helps to cover doctor services and outpatient care. And in some instances, it also covers some other medical services that Part A doesn't cover, such as some of the services of physical and occupational therapists and some home health care. And last but not least, and certainly demonstrative of a recent uh, change, is the prescri prescription drug coverage. And with that benefit, most people will pay a monthly premium for this coverage and um, available to everyone with Medicare. Medicaid's benefit program is a little bit different. The services that are mandated by statute, there are approximately 13 of those, and they include such things as nursing facility services, inpatient hospital services, uh, intermediate care for the mentally retarded, uh, and the list goes on. In addition to those 13 mandatory services that every state must cover in their state Medicaid plan, there are approximately 24 additional optional services that states may use to uh, complement their basic package. So as you can see, Medicare and Medicaid are uh, somewhat distinct in how they are defined geographically in the service package, in the payer, and also in the eligibility uh, arena. We could go to the next slide, please. For federal purposes, we define dual eligibles, uh, again, as a person entitled to both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, for Medicare, it's because of their age, disability, uh, or ESRD condition. And for Medicaid, it's because of limited income and resources. And dual eligibles may receive payment by Medicaid of Part A and or Part B premiums, and sometimes other Medicare cost sharing. Medicaid coverage of certain services is not covered under Medicare. We could go to the next slide that talks about service delivery. Um, Medicare individuals are able to choose a delivery system either through a Medicare Advantage plan, which is considered to be a um, managed care option. They also have the opportunity to receive their services through a fee-for-service system. In the Medicaid program, the state government determines what delivery systems are available. And there are four options. Um, there may be a choice between managed care or fee-for-service. Um, states have the option of mandatorily enrolling all of their individuals in a managed care program without a fee-for-service option. Um, and that was option number two here. Some states actually mandate that their services um, that they provide some of the services through a managed care organization and other services through fee-for-service. In those instances, we have uh, typically seen that states have provided behavioral health services through a managed care uh, environment and complemented their other uh, services for Medicaid through a fee-for-service entity. And then some states have no managed care option and uh, use a fee-for-service system for all of their service. 
And so we have some opportunity here for uh, being challenged on how do we make these two programs with two very separate and distinct uh, sets of requirements work together. Well, our administration has actually, if we could go to the next slide, uh, we have a CMS priority. And we've actually formed a special work group within our organization. And this particular uh, work group includes membership from our Center for Medicaid and State Operations, from our Center for Beneficiary Choices, which represents Medicare, the Office of Research Demonstrations and Information, which has the responsibility to design and oversee the demonstrations, our regional offices, and the Office of Policy, which coordinates the group's activities. Um, this particular work group reports directly to our administrator, and we have ongoing work with um, some external organizations as well that include the Center for Healthcare Strategies, the National Health Policy Group, and the Reforming States Group. What I'd like us to do at this point in time, if we can, um, is go to our website. And uh, this website is a byproduct of this work group. And it contains um, four things, maybe five, that I would like to share with you. Uh, I want you to see what it looks like. Are we able to get there? Yep, I'm navigating to that website right now. Terrific. Um, this particular website uh, has an introductory page and uh, talks a little bit about integrated models of care. We've actually expanded the terminology from dual eligibles to integrated systems of care. Uh, the information that's contained on this website include um, something called a state guide to integrated care. This is actual, actually a document. We consider it a living document that expresses at this point in time at least four models of integrating care for individuals who are duly eligible under the federal system. In response to um, barriers that are relative to providing services for people who are dual eligible, we also created three how-to guides. Those how-to guides are also um, a part of this particular website. And we have an enrollment how-to guide. We have a marketing how-to guide and we have a quality how-to guide. These are tools for states and for health plans to be able to reference to look at how um, the various requirements for these two federal programs can operate together to reduce some of the administrative barrier of providing services to these individuals. We also, um, if it's not there yet, should be there any moment, have a link to uh, a Medicare bid primer that was prepared by CHCS. And uh, last but not least, if you have questions after we hang up here today, there is a, a mailbox there for you to submit questions about the provision of care and services for these individuals that um, we monitor on a routine and regular basis, and we'll get back to you with answers. So we're working on some additional ways also to facilitate um, the way in which we work with plans and states and providers um, to look at advancing and uh, increasing our ability to provide services in integrated care models. But Congress, again, uh, has done something unique and different for us. And they've created special needs plans. And with that, I would like to turn it over to um, Jim to talk a little bit about uh, what is a special needs plan and um, what are those particular opportunities intended to help us to do to provide and improve our delivery of health care to these individuals. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Verdier, this is Jim Cooney. If I can just uh, interrupt you for five seconds before you begin, I'm just going to um, change the setting and reopen the phone line so that those who can't hear the bro broadcast will be able to. Okay. All right, you may proceed. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Okay, that's the topic. Um, what I'm going to do in this uh, next few minutes is uh, describe briefly special needs plans, uh, talk a little bit about the enrollment challenges they face, and then talk about uh, what the interest states have or may have in contracting with special needs plans. Uh, special needs plans can specialize in serving people who are in nursing facilities, 
people who are dual eligibles and other people with severe and disabling chronic conditions. Obviously, lots of overlaps uh, in those categories. An important thing to remember is that SNPs are Medicare plans, and they cover only Medicare services unless they contract with a state Medicaid agency to cover uh, some Medicaid or duals. There are, as of uh, July, 273 uh, special needs plans, almost all of them for dual eligibles, but a small number then for chronic conditions and a small number, a uh, relatively small number of institutional plans. We did for MedPAC a snapshot of SNP activity in three market areas uh, earlier this year, and you can take a look at that if, uh, uh, if you'd like. The enrollment as of July 1 uh, was about 531,000. Most of those, again, in the dual eligible plans. Uh, and the chronic and disabling condition plans, apart from a monster plan in Puerto Rico, uh, there's about 1,000 in the dozen or so in the rest of the country. Uh, as you can see there, most of the institutional plans are Evercare, which is a subsidiary of United Healthcare. Uh, the dual eligible enrollment is very heavily concentrated in nine states plus Puerto Rico. About half of that enrollment is in plans that, so, that uh, passively enrolled uh, beneficiaries who were previously enrolled in a state Medicaid managed care plan, and that Medicaid managed care plan either established a SNP itself or uh, uh, was associated with a special needs plan. And most passive enrollment was in the states indicated there in approximately the order of, of volume of passive enrollment. There are a large number of SNPs with very low enrollment, as you can see at the bottom of the page there as of, uh, as of July. What are some of the options for building special needs plan enrollment? There are a number of instances in which large national uh, plans have standalone prescription drug plans uh, that are in the same geographic area. Uh, as the special needs plans. And uh, special needs plans can also work through physicians and clinics and community organizations in uh, the local areas. And states, states can help uh, special needs plans identify duels and inform duels about the uh, uh, special needs plan uh, options. One thing I skipped over and should not have is the slide you now see. Uh, which indicates that almost all of the dual eligibles are in these standalone prescription drug plans uh, that provide only a drug benefit and not any of the other associated benefits. Uh, and most special needs plans have few ways to identify duals and to market to them. Uh, dual eligibles can change plans at any time, so they are uh, a target for a lot of the enrollment activities by plans that are seeking to uh, induce them to change their enrollment to, uh, to another plan. Uh, but at least currently, before the, the new marketing period begins uh, in a week or so, uh, most of the duels say at least that they are satisfied in the plans to, uh, to which they've been assigned. Uh, so again, that, that leads into the options for building enrollment that I just talked about. Uh, So what are the uh, interactions between special needs plans and states that are important to look at? Uh, special needs plans that offer only Medicare benefits may have difficulty demonstrating that they're adding value beyond what a standard uh, Medicare managed care plan could offer. And one way of uh, adding some additional value would be to cover uh, some portion of the Medicaid benefits uh, or all of the Medicaid benefits that dual eligibles are entitled to, and that could make navigating the system considerably easier for the duals. It could also facilitate better coordination of their care. Uh, and there's a reference at the bottom there to the how-to guides that uh, Terry mentioned in her presentation. Um, the states that currently offer 
Medicaid managed long-term care or that plan to do that in the near future are probably the best prospects to, uh, for special needs plans to partner with because if a state is just uh, uh, offering acute care, there's really not very much of the Medicaid acute care benefit uh, that, that still remains now that drugs have shifted over uh, to Medicare. And the states that do offer these managed long-term care programs are listed in the second bullet, and there's a good AARP report or AARP issue brief that describes uh, those uh, programs. The last bullet mentions the states that Melanie mentioned that are working with the Center for Healthcare Strategies. So why would states want to contract with special needs plans? Uh, one, as I mentioned a moment ago, is to improve care coordination for dual eligibles. Uh, there are also potential administrative efficiencies if, they have, if state Medicaid agencies have to cover some aspects of the Medicaid benefit, like the Medicare cost sharing, uh, the nine or so categories of drugs excluded from Part D, vision, dental, things of that sort. On a fee-for-service basis, that can be pretty awkward and inefficient for beneficiaries, for providers, and for the Medicaid agencies themselves. So there are uh, options for simply paying a managed care organization of a specified amount up front uh, on a per member per month basis simply to cover that portion of the Medicaid benefit package that uh, the dual eligibles are entitled to and get it through their special needs plan. Uh, there's also an opportunity for states to save money because there's a lot of overlap between the vision and dental and hearing benefits that special needs plans and other Medicare plans may offer with the so-called savings that they uh, get if they bid below uh, a certain benchmark level for their Medicare managed care. Uh, and finally, it, it can be a move toward fuller integration in the sense of developing uh, relationships with the plans and getting a better understanding of their perspective and the plans getting a better understanding of state perspectives. So what are some of the benefits? Uh, and in the order of increasing complexity and comprehensiveness, I've listed those there on the slide. And the primer that Terry Pratt mentioned uh, that uh, I did for the Center for Healthcare Strategies is on the CHCS website, and you can get more detail on those benefits and the pros and cons of offering them through special needs plans uh, from that primer. S some of the challenges for states and special needs plans, uh, there are a lot of uh, potentially conflicting Medicare and Medicaid managed care rules. They cover essentially the same topics, but they're different in detail because they arose at different times and frankly because they were administered by different parts of the, the CMS bureaucracy over time. But the work group that Terry described is making very major efforts to uh, ease some of those existing barriers and I think is making a lot of progress on doing that. Another issue is just setting capitated rates for nursing facility and home and community-based services. Not a lot of experience doing that in either state Medicaid programs or in Medicare. Uh, and one of the important things there is to give the plans incentives to, to make more use of home and community-based service and less use of uh, institutional nursing facility care. And the Center for Healthcare Strategies has contracted with Rick Kronick uh, to develop uh, some options for Capitated, capitating those benefits, and Rick uh, developed the most commonly used capitation system for acute care. And so we're looking forward to seeing what he comes up with there. Uh, and also just the, the degree of experience that uh, uh, special needs plans have in serving be beneficiaries in home and community-based service settings. It's not something commonly done in Medicare, and uh, a lot of the plans just don't have a lot of experience doing that. So just to summarize, uh, there are really, at this point, uh, about a dozen, maybe as many as 20 states that might be in a position to contract with special needs plans uh, for coverage of Medicaid benefits. Uh, but I think it's important for states and special needs plans, even if they're not there yet, uh, to start to work together on 
parts of the benefit package that they, uh, that they can coordinate better uh, to start to lay the groundwork for further integration in the future. And as I mentioned and as Jerry mentioned, the uh, CMS is really doing a, uh, a terrific job to facilitate and encourage those kinds of activities. So uh, I think there's really a lot of promise there. Thank you very much, Jim and Terry, and also thanks to Danielle Moon for joining us um, so that we have both Medicaid and Medicare represented from the CMS perspective. While we're waiting for a few questions to come in, I just want to emphasize a couple of things that were mentioned. There are tremendous resources out there. I noticed that over 50% of uh, participants on the call are either health plans or states, and their uh, CMS has done a great job of aligning the resources that are available from both the state perspective and from the plan perspective. And the address for those materials is available on the Kennedy Innovators website. CHCS can also post that, and it's also available by going to www.cms.hhs.gov, and there's a site for duly eligible beneficiaries. And again, we can post all of that, but what's important are, are the resource documents that are available. And as Terry mentioned, for, especially for entities interested in getting started in this arena, looking at the how-to guides for enrollment, marketing, and quality are very helpful, as is the overall integrated care guide. And on the CHCS website, you can find materials uh, relative to rate setting and risk adjustment and performance measurement and Medicare bidding. And just to emphasize, these areas have all been chosen because they were the ones expressed by states as those providing the greatest challenges to trying to integrate care. So having said that, um, Jim, I'm going to go to you for the first question. There is a request to please, please define or give a little more clarity to passive enrollment. Yeah, what that is is something that CMS and uh, the special needs plans and states in probably seven or eight or more states uh, decided on in essentially mid-2005. And this was a situation in which in the states the uh, dual eligibles were enrolled in capitated Medicaid managed care plans were getting their drugs uh, and their other Medicaid services through those plans. And the idea was that uh, in order to make the transition to Medicare coverage of those uh, beneficiaries as, as seamless and as trouble-free as possible, uh, if there was an opportunity for those beneficiaries to simply continue to get their Medicaid drug coverage uh, through the same managed care organization starting January uh, by dint of being so-called passively enrolled in this new special needs plan, which was run by the same organization as, as the plan they were currently in and currently getting their drugs from, it would be an easier way for them to continue to, uh, to get their, their drugs. And the term was pass the term passively enrollment refers to uh, the process by which the beneficiaries were enrolled. They didn't have to take an initiative themselves uh, to be moved into the special needs plan for their drug coverage, but they did have the opportunity and, and still do uh, to opt out of that coverage and, and get their uh, prescription drugs covered in some other way through a standalone prescription drug plan if they wanted to, uh, to do that. Uh, and so that's, that's what happened there. Uh, probably, uh, oh, you know, 250, 300,000 passive enrollees. CMS hasn't put out any official numbers yet, uh, but approximately that that many around the country concentrated in about uh, uh, seven or eight states. Great, thank you very much. And there was a question about who was speaking. That was Jim Berdier from Mathematical Policy Research. Terry and Danielle, there's a question regarding. Um, CMS and promulgating regulations to establish SNPs. I wonder if you could speak at all to uh, whether there will be any uh, promulgation. Danielle's going to respond to that question. Uh, yes, this is Danielle Moon. And we did promulgate regulations when the law was first enacted in 2003. The, um, the SNP provisions, special needs plan provisions, were part of our regulations for um, the Medicare Advantage program. They're in that. Um, regulation. Uh, I want to say they're in a couple of places in our regulations at, 420, at, at uh, 42 CFR section 422. 
Um, there's a definition of what a special special needs individual is, and then there's also some revised language in our enrollment regulations that talk about you know how enrollment can be limited for these particular um, plans. Great, thank you very much. Chuck, I wonder if you could spend a minute um, talking a little bit about what characteristics of the duals you think are least understood um, and, and are really uh, things that plans that are interested in entering into these types of programs should pay attention to. Um, well, I'll just highlight one, and this does um, track some, some work that we did that was with some CHCS funding. And um, one of the things that I think that, that um, needs to be understood is for the dual eligibles who live in the community as opposed to in nursing facilities, um, the extent to which they have gone through any kind of rigorous assessment process by a state Medicaid program or for that matter a Medicare program is, is um, it, it's not, uh, most people have not gone through an assessment. And so um, there, there was an article that was published in Health Affairs a while back that, uh, having to do with uh, pent-up demand and, and the fact that a lot of duals may have needs that have never been assessed, that um, once assessed, the plans may have some obligations to provide services. Uh, I think it's an important thing for the plans to understand, for states to understand, is that there is there are a lot of people in the community who are receiving informal supports from family members and friends or, or who may have functional impairments that um, are not being supported with services like attendant care. And once you go out and assess your members, you may realize that people have more needs than uh, some of the healthcare claims data might have suggested. So I, I guess one of the, the things that I, uh, I do want to sort of draw to the surface here is um, there may be more need than people realize because uh, the assessments haven't occurred and that data hasn't been collected and plans of care haven't been made for many people, particularly in the community, who aren't going through a, a, a more rigorous uh, MDS kind of process like uh, they would get in an institutional setting. Thank you. That's very helpful. We have time for a couple more questions, and I want to just assure the audience members, the participants, that we will try to get to all of them, but we may have to hold some until the end. So I'm going to take a couple of quick ones. One is for CMS. Is Melanie Bellis? I'm sorry if I might, may interrupt for a second and just throw out another reminder to our audience members, if they haven't already, to please mute their phones by pressing 6. If you have muted your phone already, then you can disregard this message. Sorry, Melanie. Okay, thank you. Just to finish what I was saying, we're going to throw out a couple of quick ones. And this one is to CMS. Just a question about uh, acknowledging that SNPs are set to sunset and a question about if you could um, speculate for us on the likelihood of SNPs to be extended. Uh, this is Danielle. I mean, we don't, I guess, knowing as much as we do about how things play out, we never really like to try and predict what's going to happen. Um, you know, in terms of what Congress is going to do. Um, you know, we know that this report will be coming out and, you know, about about SNPs. It's unfortunate that we're not going to have a lot of time, you know, having passed since um, since SNPs have been in existence. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be willing to give a prediction. I just know personally that, you know, it's, we've had other provisions that have been sunsetted and then they're continuously extended. So, um, you know, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if that sunset provision was modified in some way, but um, that's about all we can say, I think. Well, thank you, and thank you for letting us put you on the spot. I think yeah. with, as evidence of the interest in SNFs, it would be the number of uh, SNFs that have been approved, and I don't know if Jim or perhaps Danielle or Perry could let us know when we expect to get um, information on the 2007 plans. I know there's been early results released that look like we're expecting quite a significant growth, especially in the chronic care SNFs. And perhaps that's something we can say for the end if there's time. Right. I know, I think the total stands now around 471 or so SNPs or special needs plans, and that includes the 2007 numbers. Um, I unfortunately I don't have a breakdown with me, but um, that's certainly something that we could get, I think. I, I mean, I know we have it, and I think that we've been, I know we've been talking about it publicly, so I don't think it'd be a problem to, to share it. And the main fact be on our website. Yeah, Melanie, uh, the Medicare Advantage News, uh, uh, which says they got the information from CMS, 
said that there were 470 SNPs approved for 2007, uh, 311 of them dual eligibles, 85 institutional, and 74 chronic conditions. Great. Yes, we helpful to hear that confirmed from CMS. So thank you, Jim, and thank you, Danielle. At this point, we're going to uh, collect the remainder of the questions and hold them till the end. And it's really important. We spent. Um, I want to thank again Chuck and Terry and Jim and Danielle. And we we have spent um, we uh, the beginning of the call sort of academically talking about who these duals are. And it's really important to put a face on on the dual eligible and to understand how difficult it is for a person to navigate these two systems and the likelihood that they may not be getting services um, that are the best in terms of quality and in terms of cost effectiveness. And so to put a face on the duel for us and remind us about what it is we're trying to do to make care for these folks better, we are joined by Diane Flanders and Bob Master. Diane is the Director of Coordinated Care Systems uh, for the State of Massachusetts in the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. And for those of you that don't know, Massachusetts is one of the pioneer states in this area. There are three states that received uh, what we refer to as Medi Medi demonstrations, the Medicare Medicaid demonstration. And uh, Massachusetts is one of those states. And so Diane's been at this for a while and does a wonderful job of kind of helping us figure out how to, how to get these programs accomplished and, and just work around any barriers. So with that, I'm going to ask the audience one more time to please remember to mute yourself by, by putting your phone on stick. There's someone that we can hear who may be having this on hold. Um, nevertheless, with that, we're going to turn it over to Diane, and uh, thank you for joining us, Diane. Okay. Well, thank you, Melanie. Just a phone call. Call one. I'm sorry. I'm just going to mute everybody. Melanie, if you can unmute yourself after I'm done. Any apologies for these sound troubles? This line is now unmuted. This line is now muted. Okay, this is Melanie Bella again. Diane, I think we're ready for you. That's fine. Thank you. Can, uh, uh, very pleased again to, to be here and to be able to share with you some of our adventures as we put the uh, Mass Health Secret Care Options Program together. We call it SCO or SCO for short, and it has been um, uh, an opportunity to really <laughs> work for, for quite a while. Um, in an interesting kind of partnership with MS so that Medicare and Medicaid could put together a program that would meet the needs of seniors who um, really are at quite high risk of some of the concerns that states would have around particularly uh, placements and the costs associated with those. So um, just very quickly, I, I, I think I will go through these slides quite quickly because I would like to uh, give you a chance to hear from um, uh, Commonwealth Care, Dr. Bob Master, who will follow. Now, um, I, I'm just here we are with, with the introductory slide and just talking briefly about the objectives. Um, really wanted to align the Medicaid and Medicare program and financing incentives. We really saw the need for accountability for the delivery, coordination, and management of quality care. We became very aware that, that we were seeing uh, problems particularly related to what happened to people when they were in a Medicare paid setting, uh, acute hospitals, particularly elderly people in a very short time uh, were experiencing uh, problems that basically uh, created a very slippery slope into nursing homes. And to be able to work with Medicare and with the acute and physician establishment in a real partnership became very important to keep people in their homes and communities over time to achieve cost savings through the prevention of the disability and the deterioration. Now, it took a little while. These are the most uh, recent events on the milestone uh, uh, listing here. Uh, we have worked with Office of Research and Demonstrations and Information um, for some time um, and uh, goes back to the year 2000. Uh, 
uh, going through a period of rate development, state legislation, and then finally going to a joint procurement and selecting senior tier organizations in 2003, jointly doing a, a really a Medicare-style readiness on contracting process in 2004, uh, and beginning the enrollments at that point. We're still pretty much in startup, but very soon we reached the point where MMA uh, appeared, and by 2006, our senior care organizations have become um, <laughs> have become special needs plants. So let me see here. Let me see my next my next slide here. Uh, for for uh, state people listening, um, I think it's probably interesting to just touch on the authority. We did not use a waiver um, for our program. We used the 1950 state plan option, which allows voluntary managed care programming through a state plan rather than having to have um, a, a waiver. Uh, on the Medicare side, we initially used a 222 payment waiver, which each of the senior care organizations was granted. This is transitioning now to a full Medicare Advantage diagnosis-based risk adjustment process, which will be, um, which will be in place uh, at the end of 2007. Right now, these are Medicare Advantage Part D plans with some variances, but as uh, you heard from CMS, there's been terrific progress in approaching some of the areas that used to need, you know, special demonstration consideration, whether it was the, the marketing and the enrollment issues. Uh, we've still got some work to do on the contracting, but it really, uh, at this particular point in time, looks as if there will be some uh, much less need for any special consideration forward. These are the areas, the key areas where the state and um, CMS, particularly our regional office, now that the programs are up and operating, uh, to get them there we needed a lot of help from central office. But now that they're up, it is the region on the Medicare side particularly that helps tremendously with these activities. Performance, measurement, financial ability, marketing and outreach, enrollment, complaints and appeals. We use the term complaint in ours, which is similar to the, the grievance terminology, the network expansion, and the focus reviews. So we have quite a bit of work together that we do, and it really has been important to us. Okay, let me move here to the highlights. I think I'm there. <laughs> um, let me just double check here. Yes. Uh, these are the really important value-added dynamics of this SCO package. These are the things that have been very special to us. It's what we consulted with geriatricians and geriatric nurse practitioners and so forth as we were preparing this model. And these are the kinds of things that they talked about and suggested came to caring for this very special population. Centralized enrollee record. Now, this is not a whole medical record, but it is the current outcome available 24-7 on the next bullet to a case manager. And that's technically how the care gets monitored and provided. The joint CMS and state Medicare style monitoring. Extra benefits not routinely available in fee-for-service to encourage enrollments. Multiple Medicaid rating categories. It's kind of interesting the way we've gone ahead with that based on the clinical level of need and the setting of care. So there is, there is a whole scheme. We actually have six major categories of, of uh, rates for the Medicaid side, three community level, and nursing home level. And that really gives the, the, the clear capacity for managing the care across that spectrum. And we make a point both on the federal and the state side to provide technical support to those, those to the senior care organizations for enrollment and their screening and reporting activities. Uh, we, up, oh, oh, did I skip one? All right, here we are. The, the uh, payment model, uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, there really are separate Medicaid and Medicare monthly capitation rates, and those are combined at the SCO contractor level each month. Mentioned again, the Medicare rates are the um, HCC diagnosis-based rates. Um, at this point, they're at 
75% of the rates are at that level and 25 still at the old rate book level. And then we have uh, the 24 categories. And we have also put in place in our particular design uh, a three-month transition incentive. First three months a person goes into a nursing home, we will continue payment on the community level. Uh, first three months a person comes home from a nursing home, we continue the payment at the higher uh, nursing home level so that the uh, community has the ability to really put a package of services in place. Uh, with some additional resources in the early stages, which are the most critical. Okay. Uh, the benefits to Mass Health seniors, uh, again, it's a voluntary program. People have a choice of a senior care organization, and within that, a choice of a primary care physician. Many times, uh, it is their own physician that uh, also is contracting with one of the senior care organizations. The expert coordination delivery of all services, sign off on an individualized plan of care, which is part of our design, the 24-7 nurse case management, the up-to-date centralized record, the quality care consisted with, consistent with geriatric standards, and day-to-day -day accountability of the SCOs for the care and services to CMS in the state. Uh, on a more uh, grassroots level, we have uh, Part D is covered. Uh, in our particular state, we are fortunate that we have state coverage, so there are no copays or deductibles for pharmacy. Relief from Medicare paperwork, relief from Medicaid screening hurdles. We have a very generous Medicaid program in Massachusetts, but people will, uh, can have to go through five, eight, ten different kinds of screening requirements for the different services required. And that goes away with this kind of managed care model. Flexible services, traditional and otherwise, access to vision, hearing, dental, and podiatry, as was mentioned earlier, and also specialized community support. One of the uh, design features is that we affirmatively involve the AAAs in this state in this model, the social services, um, uh, are, are delivered on the primary care teams with a contractor from the AAA in our state at the Aging Service Access Points. And that's been a very interesting development, uh, and it's working quite well. Benefit to network providers, the uh, nurse and social work teams, uh, again, support the primary care physician, wrap around that physician 24-7. The geriatric and behavioral health and other clinical specialty networks so consults within the network are available not only to physicians, but other medical elements providing home care or any of the other uh, complex components. They also can access that help. You have creative, flexible services for enrollees, whatever the primary care physician determines is appropriate, and the opp opportunity for non-traditional contracting beyond fee-for-service limitations. The senior care organizations can buy services from the different kinds of provider groups according to what the actual enrollees need, not according to the traditional limits of Medicare or Medicaid fee-for-service regulations. Okay, so then just real quickly, who are the SCOs? Um, I, I think... Uh, uh, many of you know we have Evercare, which is a subsidiary of United Healthcare, and their service area is essentially the, the whole state. Um, well, Care Alliance, who you'll be hearing from next, with three large physician groups and five community health centers in their service area, we've put here, and Senior Whole Health, which is an independent network, which includes the Caritas Christie and other hospitals in Eastern Mass. And we've been very excited at, at um, our current sc status here. We have high enrollment, which has been very interesting, in underserved, diverse neighborhoods um, who, for the first time, really have service, uh, 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 services available that are culturally appropriate and people who speak their languages. And we've been very excited at seeing some of that particular development. The involvement of the aging industry has been very positive as, as new SCO aging industry business is building. We see the transition actually to the special needs plan, MAPD, move the demonstration really into a formal Medicare status, and that's been enhanced now by the recent CMS 
subsetting guidance, which we can talk about another time that's a little <laughs> detailed, but we've also benefited from very high profile bipartisan support within our state government, and that can be very important going forward. So thank, thank you very much, Diane. One quick question from one of the uh, audience members is how many people are currently enrolled in the program? Right. At the moment, we have approximately 6,000 people enrolled in SCO. Great. So you heard it here. This is a living, breathing state that's done it, um, in addition to others that are out there uh, who have done it, Minnesota and Wisconsin and, uh, and others that are just getting started. Uh, New York, Washington, New Mexico. But Diane, thank you for giving us a perspective of the state. Now I'm going to turn it over to Bob Master, who's the President and CEO of Commonwealth Care Alliance. And I can't say enough for Bob. Um, I don't think that the Center for Healthcare Strategies would be where we are in this issue today uh, were it not for his, his passion and his leadership. So um, with that, Bob, please tell us um, what it's like to be actually integrating care for this very complex population. Thank you for the kind words, Melanie. And uh, it's always a pleasure to follow Diane, and I think I'd start with the word integration. You you can't do integration at the care level fully until you have integration at the payer and policy level. And and I think uh, the work between uh, Diane at our state Medicaid program and Bill Clark and his leadership in CMS is the best example I I know of around that integration. So we follow from there. So. Let me follow up uh, uh, in, in, in just a few minutes and, and give you a perspective from the uh, care delivery side. And, I, and, and we view ourselves as a, as, as a prepaid care delivery system um, uh, as we think that the predominant approaches to people with the needs that uh, uh, were mentioned so clearly by Chuck Milligan and others uh, re really requires clinical redesign of the delivery system. Um, and Commonwealth Care Alliance is a nonprofit uh, prepaid care system that is really trying to build on a lot of the work that was done here in Massachusetts and, and, and actually in, in other places around the country in pilot and smaller models that have demonstrated how you use prepaid financing and integrated financing to improve care for these uh, populations. Um, if we really look at both the uh, under age 65 and the over age 65 uh, duly eligible population, um, they, they're obviously quite different in, in terms of their clinical needs, but they have some common uh, uh, attributes which, which really are the clues to the care system redesigns. Uh, all of them have a very significant mix of chronic illness, disabilities, and as you'll see in a couple of the examples I'll mention briefly, very uh, complex social and behavioral health. Uh, issues uh, that have to be attended to. A uh, key issue is all of them have very low thresholds to secondary medical complications. And this is the main driver of emergency room and hospital use. Um, and this is also the great opportunity, uh, the, the opportunity to prevent or retard or delay these complications through redesigned care delivery. Um, the vast majority of hospitalizations in ours and uh, in, in our systems uh, really occurs through the emergency room, uh, and and usually when an emergency room is encountered, uh, uh, there's a high percentage that goes to the hospital. And one of the issues that that speaks to the need for integration with a capital I uh, is the uh, significant degree of behavioral health or mental health issues that we see uh, in this population. And when you mix that with the chronic medical conditions, you really incur very very high costs. This is both a challenge uh, and an opportunity give you a couple of quick case studies uh, that really illustrate the face of, of the dual population. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, the first is a, is, a, is a case study of an individual who was under the age of 65 with significant disabilities. Uh, her initials are AC. She's 50 years old, long-standing multiple sclerosis. She has lower extremity uh, paralysis. Uh, for the non-clinicians, I'll try to translate the, 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 some of the medical uh, terminology here. She requires a wheelchair and a walker. She also has uh, urinary retention, and as the clinicians know, will require frequent self-catheterizations. That's a very, very uh, 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 difficult technique that often requires a high degree of attention to sterility and is, uh, otherwise is very high risk of secondary uh, uh, urinary tract infections. And here are the complications that we talked about. Uh, depression, 
uh, uh, social complexity, major suicide history, also history of alcohol use as well. And this characterizes uh, uh, many, many, uh, this kind of thing characterizes many, many uh, uh, people uh, with special needs that, that we find. Heavy smoker and chronic lung disease as well. So you can predict, the clinicians can predict what the frequent hospital contacts will be for urinary complications, respiratory complications, and these are also uh, uh, individuals that have very difficult science establishing relations with uh, primary care f uh, uh, physicians. Um, a, a second case, which is um, really the, uh, illustrates so much of why uh, the work of Diane Flanders and others has been so important and um, uh, in, in, in why we need an integrated system. Uh, this is uh, Maddie H., a 77-year-old woman, very independent, lives alone, um, uh, but has a long history of serious chronic illnesses, uh, decades of diabetes, high blood pressure. Over this time, um, secondary strokes, uh, weakness on one side, and increasing requirements for personal assistance. Um, uh, inability, progressive inability with all of these medical issues to get to the sources of medical care in doctors' offices or, or clinics or hospitals. And in the fee-for-service world, a very fragmented approach uh, to all of the services that she needs to be put together in a coordinated way. She couldn't uh, access the aging network, couldn't get personal care attendant services easily, had, there were limitations on Medicaid-covered home health. And uh, with recurrent hospitalizations, frequent falls, inadequate food intake, increasing depression, uh, the, the feistiness of this particular individual was, was a literally uh, being sapped from her, and the, and the family was seriously considering a, a, a nursing home placement, which is so often the story uh, and illustrates so many of the people that you see in our, in our senior care. Uh, organization and so the questions are: What do we? What have we learned downstream from integrated uh, 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 payers, the risk-adjusted payment systems, the joint contracting, um, and 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 what we've learned really stems from the work over many many years and even decades of just a number of pilot programs, some of which are listed li uh, li uh, uh, listed here, um, and and what would be some of the elements. Uh, that these pilot programs have taught us of make some difference. And one of the things that uh, we've learned that's really crucial is consumer involvement in shaping the care system, and particularly for the younger populations with disability. And, uh, and, and there's a lot to be said there, and, and, and time doesn't permit here. Uh, there really needs to be involved specialized uh, primary care networks. Um, and the next one down is this. You look at these individuals that I've described, um, the, these needs overwhelm uh, the, the ability of physicians in traditional patterns of ambulatory practice where you have productivity expectations and 15 to 20 minute visits and a complete inability to manage domains outside of medical care such as uh, the behavior, behavioral health domain, the support and long term care domain. Um, uh, all of that requires a team approach to both extend of uh, primary care as well as to coordinate this. And the models that are developed in one iteration or another in all of the pilot programs and in our model is now the use of teams, uh, nurse or nurse practitioners teaming with physicians, and as Diane mentioned, in the senior care option program, uh, the use of uh, 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 geriatric social workers uh, linking the home and community services. Uh, and then you absolutely need to attend to all of the other following, uh, round the clock availability, into uh, continuity through the hospital, long-term care setting, support by electronic medical records, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a key thing on this list is the ability to move care into home settings. Um, when you have 20 to 30 percent of your population, as Chuck Milligan mentioned, that may have mobility limitations, ADL dependencies, you may you have to move decision making to them, um, and and that's, that's an, and and that's a, a key part uh, of of any redesigned uh, uh, care system. Um, and let me just see where I got. Um, let me just give you now a couple of examples in the next couple of minutes in some of the work we've done in pilot programs. A program for younger adults with very severe disabilities and spinal cord injury that really was relying 
um, almost exclusively on multiple clinics and hospitals and having the emergency room for a whole variety of issues better perhaps handled elsewhere and recurrent hospitalizations had that system replaced by a nurse practitioner uh, uh, model of care that moved 80 to 90 percent of medical contacts to the home setting or to the work setting with a system to respond quickly to new problems, all of which was difficult in the fee-for-service system and, 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 and in, a, in an experimental contract model uh, for many years. Um, and, and the results of that really are, are in these graphs, and there's just two I'll give you. Uh, in the medic, in the red graphs, this 1999 and 2002, uh, these were the total monthly medical expenses fee-for-service in the Medicaid system for a similar population of people with really severe physical disabilities, uh, prototypically spinal cord injured or with very advanced neuromuscular diseases. And in the blue is really the results of the prepaid care system with a lot of investment uh, into, the, into the nurse practitioner model. And the reason is here, uh, going all the way back to the early 1990s, what you see in this population is, and these are numbers of, you see 854 and 1233 on the left side of the, the, the graph, that's essentially a budget for failed opportunities, uh, $1,000 a month per person for hospitalizations for problems that could be intervened on. And on the right side, that's in the years of these pilot programs um, uh, what, in fact, the hospital costs were. And uh, a lot of investment has to go into the system of care, into the, into the uh, care coordination and enhanced primary care, but it's more than offset by the back-end savings with a very substantial uh, return on in, in investment. Um, and finally, a couple of slides on the program that um, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're operating in collaboration with uh, Diane and, uh, and, and CMS. And this is the look, this is a year old, uh, looking at about 700 of the first, uh, the first 700 enrollees that we had in our senior care options. And as Diane mentioned, remarkably, we're really getting to communities that were separate from care. 70% from minority communities with considerable uh, health care disparities. English is a primary language in, in a very small minority. Very high Medicare risk scores uh, telling us is what we see clinically that these are, are very medically complicated uh, individuals. Uh, and in, in, in this first 700 enrollees, uh, very high degree of member satisfaction, very low uh, voluntary disenrollment rate. A lot of increased investment, as we mentioned, in primary care and care coordination. But at least in the first couple of years, reduced uh, nursing home placements when compared to what, what is seen in benchmark populations and hospitalization expenses that are very low as a percentage of premium as our emergency room expenses. Still early, uh, still not emerging, I, I think clearly to say from the um, from pilot to scale stage, but a lot of arrows pointing in the right direction uh, for the senior population as well as the disability population. Um, and I think this is probably a good place to stop this and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bob. One, one quick point of clarification, and then we'll get to some of the other questions. Uh, someone asked you to please clarify when you stated that clinical decisions need to be transferred to the home. Yeah, w what we've found over many years, and in fact, uh, other, other, other clinically-based pilot programs, was that there, the, 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 the barriers to care by taking an individual who, who is perhaps uh, wheelchair dependent and, uh, and, and, and needing total assistance from in all activities or most activities of daily living um, are just too much, too, too much to get uh, to an, an office or a clinic. Uh, imagine the problems of an individual such as the first case we, uh, I, I illustrated who calls in the morning with, say, fever and a potentially very serious urinary tract infection. In our state, uh, in, to get to, uh, uh, you, you know, in, in the fee-for-service world, you, you would, to get a ride uh, to an office, you would require a 24-hour notice. Uh, a 10 o'clock appointment may get a pickup at 8 in the morning or 12 noon or, or not at all. Um, the, the, from in, the, in the prepaid care system, we would spend between $100 and $200 for that service. 
um, the, 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 the redesign says for that money we can move that assessment uh, to the home with far less hassle uh, and far more efficiency um, and in fact have found for certain populations that are mobility impaired uh, that that by far is a better way to manage. And then there's the whole issue of a real understanding of the complex social issues that could never, that, 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 are, that, that where there are real uh, uh, barriers to that understanding in the sterility of a, of, of a professional physician's office, but, but, but can only be achieved in, in a community or home setting. And so for those reasons, we found, given the nature of certainly not all, or perhaps not even the majority of this population, but very important subsets, um, uh, that, that, that home visiting and assessment um, uh, really think, we think is an essential component. Well, that's a perfect lead into the next question, which it can go at to either Bob or Diane or both. Could you please give a couple of examples of non-traditional or flexible services that are available under Cisco program that are outside of the traditional benefits? And I think you know you've, you've, you've touched on that, but certainly giving a little illustration of the flexibility and what it might take to meet the needs of individual tools that you can do more flexibly under this current arrangement. Um. Diane, do you want to go first, or, or I, I? Sure. I think the uh, the example we use sometimes is is uh, an air conditioner, for example. It's certainly not a covered service on any Medicare or Medicaid list, but for certain people, uh, particularly this past uh, summer, which was absolutely horrific, that really can make a difference to an older person in um, very um, uh, difficult uh, housing situation. Uh, th that that is sort of um, the the kind of of item that um, again you wouldn't see on any list, but it's only one example. There's been you know very creative uh, mechanisms put in place to try and serve people on in that individual grassroots level, and we've heard of many different examples. Uh, I'm sure, Bob, you have a couple. Well, let me just give one that's actually a case that's, that's, that's very topical right now, but it's the kind of thing that happens. We, we have a, a, an elderly um, a, a, a Puerto Rican a woman with very advanced heart disease and is, and, and is anticoagulated on, a, 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 on Coumadin, and she is, uh, is, is planning with her family to make a trip to Puerto Rico next week or the following week which may be the last time she gets home uh, to visit and to stay there for six weeks to three months. Um, what we've, and, and she needs to have frequent blood tests uh, to check her level of anticoagulation. Uh, as the clinicians will know, without that, there will be serious problems. And she needs frequent medical exams in, in Puerto Rico. The family has identified a physician that will do this for uh, uh, a sum of $35 a visit at cash on the barrel head. And uh, we've identified a lab, but again, that will do this at $20 and once a week for the blood test. So we start to add up what she's going to need for that medical care. And, the, uh, and, the, and, and, the, uh, and I, I would say the atypical benefit that we're giving her is cash. We'll be sending her down there with about $900 of our premium money to spend it, you know, uh, to spend it on, these, on these individuals, on, the, on, these, on this kind of uh, uh, service uh, as it runs outside of any of the traditional billing or contracting mechanisms, as well as trying to maintain uh, telephone contact uh, uh, with the labs and the individuals. Thank you, Bob. Um, there's a question if you could give, give um, actually this one, Diane, probably is for you, to talk a little bit more about the financing of the SCOs and talk about uh, the, is the financing fully integrated between Medicaid and Medicare? And if so, how are the costs and savings assigned to slash shared between the two programs? Well, um, that's, of course, a, a pretty complicated question. Uh, I think in, in general, uh, the, um, both Medicare and Medicaid have basically developed um, their own individual payment system. Uh, we do um, then require, uh, for example, for, for the SCOs, uh, quarterly financial reports. 
so we have some idea in terms of their um, continuing solvency and financial ability to continue and so forth. And I think that is sort of the combination of, uh, of payment and monitoring that we are directly involved in from the state side. In addition, obviously the SCOs have to do their own bidding for the Medicare side of their package. And uh, that, that is a complicated area. Uh, I think perhaps it would be a good idea for, for Bob to just at least briefly mention that. It, it does generate some concern because our model really um, was intended to once the you know once the two streams of funding reach the senior care organization, that that would become essentially SCO money, not Medicare money and not Medicaid money, but it would be um, money for use the enrollees on whatever level that turned out to be appropriate. And so to then sort of disintegrate this um, in terms of the bidding uh, and the Medicare kinds of, of sides to the story ha have been somewhat um, unsettling. And we certainly are, are hoping that we can find a very smooth way. Our, one of our major concerns would be that um, this package, when it is presented by Medicare, it, that it be clear to anyone who looks at um, the um, CMS um, website or listings or anything. But this is an integrated program. It has much more than the Medicare package of benefits. And that's been one of our concerns recently and certainly an area for a lot of discussion. Bob, talk about that Medicare bidding. That's quite a job. Oh. Well, I, I wish I could. I, 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 with all due respect, if somebody tried to figure out a more complicated, arcane, opaque way to do something, like I, and you put the best minds in the country together, I don't think you could, you could do, you could achieve that goal better. It, it is really, it is, it is trying to divine um, what. Um, what expected costs would be, and, and and obviously we do not want to be in a place where we're charging premiums to anybody. Um, there is got to be a more simplified, streamlined way. This is something that really, I guess, came, that we're really talking about the Part D uh, issue. Um, that said, uh, despite that, I, I just want to make a very strong. Um, uh, I, I don't know how to say this in this any, any any more strongly. We run two. Programs. One is the fully integrated model the, with the senior care options, which is the Medicare and Medicaid um, flow together, risk adjusted, even with the Part D bidding, which is which is a nightmare and a headache. And the other is is a, is we have a special needs plan that's just the Medicare benefit only, in which we we look to enroll people under the age of 65 with disabilities. And 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 we could talk a lot about. The, un, the benefits of the integrated model. Um, if we need, if we have an individual with significant disabilities, um, and we need on a moment's notice to increase personal care attendance, um, we can do that because we own the Medicaid money um, uh, in the senior care options. Uh, if we need to do the same thing in a younger population that we, in, in, the, in our case where we don't have the integrated product. Um, we have no quick ability. We do not have the financing ourselves to make that kind of service assessment, no matter how beneficial it is. And then there are practical issues around crossover claims and the, the automated ways Medicaid supplements Medicare payments and the fee for service that can't occur, and, and on and on. Um, so I, I guess, yes, it's a headache, as Diane mentioned, with the bidding process. But um, a very strong plea to, uh, to, to promote the integrated, the integrated Medicare and Medicaid approach as, uh, as the full, as, 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 as really the full product and the, and the special needs, as the SNP Medicare capitation really as, as I guess we see as a, certainly a major step forward than fee-for-service, but only halfway there. Thank you, Bob. We can always count on you to tell it like it is. Um, and I would say that that uh, there have been attempts to explain the Medicare bid process and that it was referenced earlier that there's a bid primer that was developed by Jim Berdier in consultation with CMS and that's available on the CHCS website and we'll post that link. But it is really important, I think, the distinction that both Diane and Bob are making in terms of 
integrating the financing and then some of the difficulties inherent in a bid process, especially when you want to promote flexibility to provide benefits such as air conditioners and, and remote medical services or whatever it takes to keep someone uh, in their home or in the community. Uh, related to that, either uh, Terry or Danielle or Jim, there was a question about just if someone could explain generally about reimbursement to SNPs, I think there's some confusion over whether SNPs are paid differently than other Medicare Advantage plans, and maybe you could just explain um, explain that just a bit to clarify any confusion. This is Terry and Danielle, and actually there really isn't a difference other than taking into account the, frail the additional frailty of the individuals being served. I don't even think that's being included in the payments yet. So, right, it's the same. The special needs plans are paid the same as other um, MA plans. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. And before we do that, let me just say that we will um, post uh, these presentations are posted on the, the Harvard Innovation site, but they will also be posted on the CHCS site. That's www.chcs.org. We will also post any questions that we are unable to answer, as well as links to the resource documents referenced by CMS so that people can view those. Um, behavioral health is a big issue, and I'm going to ask Bob or Diane just to comment briefly on how behavioral health services are managed and what resources are available through your program. Um, I, I can start, and then, uh, you know, in the senior care uh, options program, all uh, all the Medicare and Medicaid covered behavioral health services, which are extraordinarily uh, comprehensive and benefits, are included, and um, and we and so and that's so the models that you know we obviously have, and and I and I, and I believe that this is inherent to the, the all of the senior care option contractors is an enhanced coordination between behavioral health services and medical services, and that, that could be certainly an, uh, a clinician coordinators, uh, and, and, uh, an array of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of outpatient behavioral health services as well as uh, f facilities that are available, and, uh, and then of course uh, inpatient services, and, and the key uh, and all of that is under contract, um, and, but the key is bringing that those services uh, into a coordination, co into really coordination uh, 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 in terms of care planning at the individual, right at right at that um, uh, uh, enrollee family, right at that level, that enrollee family level, um, and so you know all all those services are in. Um, and our job is to is to make them available to the primary care team and to the and to the enrollee and, and, and the family. Um, in the FIFA service world, in contrast, I, I don't know if this is the experience of, of others, but certainly our experience has been it's 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 been extraordinarily difficult to access that that array of services um, when needed and, and and in an appropriate coordinated way. Thank you, Bob. Terry or Danielle, there's a question of um, asking if the CMS work group is looking at coverage issues for durable medical equipment or if that's hit the radar screen yet. Uh, I think if not, there's a, there's a suggestion that perhaps it's an area that we all might want to address in terms of understanding the differences in the Medicare and Medicaid coverage. I don't believe that we have an expressed um, item that's been identified to us on durable medical equipment, um, but we'll certainly take a look at that, absolutely. Great. There's a question, um, Bob, going back to the home visiting program, just a cl clarification about what percentage of your members that you're serving are, do you find to be appropriate for the home visit? Uh, well, in our senior program, we, we have about 40% of our members are, are as, uh, as we, we call them nursing home certifiable, that they have uh, ADL depend dependencies and activities of daily living that require that really limit function or mobility, and a significant percentage of those. So that you know, it, on top of back of the envelope, a third in the, in, in at least in our enrollment. Now, if we had a different case mix, it might be different. If we ha had a larger percentage of uh, uh, you know of uh, of ambul of people that are ambulatory and can get their care. Uh, in, in you know through the 
kind of more traditional ways in, in, in physician offices and, and, and community health centers, that number may be smaller. In other programs, and our, and our special needs plan is still very small, but the people with very, a population with very, very severe physical disabilities, really uh, that's a group that uh, ha uh, it, it's upwards of 90 percent, uh, and there's a lot of reasons why there's benefit uh, to that. Um, and a new program that we're developing now for uh, uh, people with intellectual disabilities, clients of our State Department of uh, Mental Retardation, there's, there's a lot uh, to be said for home visiting in the, in the group homes and, and others to help really integrate with the support systems there. Um, they've been painfully separated from sources of medical care. And, um, and, 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 there, and, and there's potential benefit. The percentages are, I think, difficult to assess. So I think it varies by the population. It varies by uh, the clinical need. Um, but it's a significant percentage. It's not, it's not a trivial percentage. Great. Thank you. We have time for one last question. And like I said, questions we did not get to, we can post the answers to um, on our website. And this really is, I would encourage any of the, the panelists to and to feel free to respond to this, and it's basically to compare what a beneficiary would get through an integrated program that he or she would not get through a home and community-based waiver service, where that person may be getting, for example, home visits and care coordination. And obviously, there's the entire set of Medicare services that the person would not be getting through a Medicaid home and community-based waiver. But perhaps you all might want to expand on some of the benefits again, bringing it back bringing the close of the call back to what really changes and what's better for a dual eligible through these programs. Melanie, this is Terry. Um, one of the items that I think you would not typically see in a home and community-based waiver program um, for a dual population or really any population unless it's otherwise offered uh, through the state plan would be prevention or intervention type services. Uh, that would be something that through an integrated care model, there would be perhaps an opportunity to uh, target some of those preventive um, support services that you would not necessarily see in a traditional C waiver. And, and let me weigh in from the state side. I think that's certainly true. I think um, all of the medical pharmacy would are, you know, uh, outside of any home and community-based waiver, uh, and so the, the, the notion of managing uh, all of the care 27 is something that really ca cannot uh, be expected of a uh, home and community-based waiver program. As, as important and as good as they are, they, they really were not designed to involve uh, all elements of the medical and uh, preventive uh, uh, clinical care. I think the uh, issues of home care experiences, you know, waiver people have to go through the same kinds of um, uh, Medicare paperwork, Medicaid screenings for any services that are not on uh, the, uh, the home and community-based waiver, and they really do have a tough time getting uh, the 24-7 full service package out there. Jim, do you have anything to add? Or Bob? No, I, th I think that I, I think what Diane said is correct. It's, it was just designed to be more limited and only coordinate a, a, a portion of the of the totality. And uh, and I mean, uh, you know, a tw twenty four you know twenty four hour availability nurses and nurse practitioners that are that have complete clinical information at all times can then have the authority to make things happen 24-7. I think that's, as Diane mentioned, uh, some of the examples of things that are just, uh, that are in the, complete, in the comprehensive model. Great. Um, in closing, I just want to ask our panelists one more time if there are any closing thoughts that they have based on the questions that we've heard and knowing the participants on the call. Is there anything else you'd say to those that are about to go down this path? Melanie, this is Terry Pratt, and um, what I would like to sort of back up to the DME question and also extend this invitation to any of the callers on the line. 
But CMS has established a mailbox for questions about dual eligibles and providing integrated care. What would probably be helpful to us uh, specifically regarding the issue of DMEs is if someone could send to us what they're experiencing as um, a conflict so that we make sure that we're addressing the right issue. And then sort of in our closing remarks, um, we would strongly encourage uh, anyone to take a look at our website, at the toolkit that we've established, um, and invite their comment and questions. And those are living documents, so we expect to be updating and uh, modifying and offering new tools uh, over time. But if you have limited experience, that's what we would offer. And I just want to vouch for the fact that, you, that CMS is very responsive to those things. And um, I think we often assume that CMS is aware of all the challenges that are occurring as, as plans or states try to get these programs up and running. And we can't assume that. So that box, mailbox exists for a reason. And I would um, just reiterate that, that CMS does tackle those issues when they're aware of us. So I'd encourage all of our callers to use that. Jim or Diane or Bob, any closing thoughts? Well, I, I actually just want to acknowledge the wonderful job that CMS is doing as we move ahead and keeping things dynamic and moving and growing and getting stronger. So I just want to be sure the world knows that they're doing a great job. Uh, let me, let me uh, absolutely echo those sentiments and also thank you, Melanie, and colleagues at the CHCS. You've, you've really been at these key leverage points now in recent years in, in such an important way, and, and this is uh, just another example of that. Well, in closing, I would say from the CHCS perspective, we, um, we couldn't do it without the states and plans and CMS uh, and all the interests. And there were a couple of questions from health plans that, that said, hey, we're interested in talking with our state about this. How can we do that? And we would offer that. Um, one of the things that CHCS can do is, is play a facilitator to let states and plans know of mutual interest in integrating these programs. And so um, I'm going to put one of my colleagues on the spot, but Lindsay Palmer, her email address is lpalmer at chcs.org. We will post that as well. If there are um, plans and states that are interested in uh, starting discussions about how to have integrated programs, we'd be happy to facilitate the, those introductions. In addition, there were some questions from health plans about successful enrollment and marketing practices. We will post some of those things on the website. And I'll say just one more time that the presentations and the links to the other resources described will be available by tomorrow morning. And we will be posting answers to questions as soon as we're able to uh, validate those answers with the experts that have presented today. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who participated in this call. And thank you very much for spending this much time with us about something that we feel is just a very significant issue um, and really has the potential to make a difference. So thank you all very much. And Jim Cooney, I don't know if there are any last remarks from your perspective. Yes, thanks, Melanie. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, all of our panelists today for a wonderful job and a wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks to our audience members and our panelists for being patient through the uh, audio troubles we are having. We appreciate that. And thank you, Melanie, for moderating today. Thank you, uh, Lindsay Palmer and Lori Martin, for pulling this tremendous panel together. And uh, I'd just like to uh, show all of our audience members, if they are interested, how to get to our text-based chat room that we're opening up so that you can continue the dialogue with uh, some of your fellow audience members. And the way to get to this chat room is you'll go to the Government Innovators Network um, at www.innovations.harvard.edu. And on our home page, you'll find a What's New section at the top right side of that page. And if you click on that link on the page that that follows, you'll see a link that says Dual Eligibles Room 1. And if you click on that link, you will enter our text-based chat room. And in there, uh, I'll be present to provide some uh, technical assistance, but it's a very easy tool to use. And you can share links with each other. You can share documents. You can share pictures. And uh, mostly, it's just an opportunity to meet some of the other people who were in attendance today and uh, continue the conversation that we started here. Our panelists are uh, certainly not obligated to go, but you're welcome to join if you like. 
And uh, with that, thank you everybody again for uh, for attending today. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes.